what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Vitaly, it's uh, so great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome, man. Ryan, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. So your book, Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life, it's a, that's a pretty big statement to say the art of the meaningful life, but it absolutely does, delivers. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. I mean, sometimes I'm pitched ideas and I'm like, oh, maybe in this case, I was reading through all of your work and thought, I have to talk to this guy. So I'm just first want to say how, how grateful I am for, for putting, for taking your thoughts from your mind and putting them onto the page. It's a, such a pleasure. And I'll tell you, when I was writing this book, I was visualizing just trying to help one person. And, you know, it just, if I could make a difference in somebody's life, what, you know, like that, that is the, one of the biggest achievements you can have, right? Outside of being a great parent, you know, you know outside of, you know, being a uh, great husband, great parent, you know, et cetera. But just for the society, I just, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to have for this, this book to have a, a positive impact on others. And so I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. One of the things you start out with is you say, I guess I was born in Russia, but made for America. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, so my life in Russia was not easy. At the time, I did not realize how difficult it was, especially in the contrast they experienced when I, you know, after moving to America. But, and I was also not the right person to grow up in Russia. Let me explain. In the, in the, I got to have to be very specific in the Soviet Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, the Soviet Russia basically wanted everybody to be the same. They did not like um, uh, people who had different opinions, who were too creative, that could stood out. And the education system basically approached everybody as a kind of, uh, there was very little attention. It, it paid very little attention to individuality. That's that's a very important point. Um, so therefore, I was a horrible student in Russia because I learned differently. I had different interests. I was horrible at memorization, and I needed to, and I also needed teachers to see that I have a potential. And they just, at least in case with my teachers, they basically approached it that I was a C student. I never got a grade higher than C you know, in Russia. Period. And even even when I'm even one time, and I'm slightly embarrassed for what I'm about to say, but I was young. Even when I cheated on my exit exam in a, in high school, and I had a basically literature teacher, literature teacher write an essay, you know, that essay still got a C. So I <laughs> I, I have a suspicion that they just never even read my essays. But anyway, so the point is. Uh, when I moved to the United States, um, the this country actually embraces, and I know a lot of times you go too far, but embraces individuality. And to me, that was incredibly important because here I, you know, I, gra- I graduated from, from a college, summa cum laude. I basically had a very high GPA. I loved going to school. When in Russia, I absolutely hate you know, going to school or to college. Um, so, and uh, this is why I think America has prospered in part because uh, it embraces, you know, individual, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it embraces creativity. What do you think now about Russia? And, and I, I guess we'll just go straight into it, like fighting a war. I have to believe that this is a question that comes up to you since I know it was different than when you were there, but like when yeah. you see the news and you see Ukraine and you see Russia and you see Putin, like what goes through your mind? So when somebody asks me where where I'm from, I now I used to say I'm, I was pro, I'm from Russia and I was proud of this. Now I just say I'm from USSR because mm. that's how I'm embarrassed I am to be from Russia. I'm wow. embarrassed. I'm I'm incredibly embarrassed what this country is doing. I was growing up hating uh, Nazis. And I would argue that you know Russian behavior today is not that much different from Nazis. 
you know, and, and this is a strong statement, you know, but I, let me, let me, let me explain this a little bit. I read, uh, you know, I still read in Russian. So I read a lot of Russian newspapers that basically look at Ukraine as an inferior nation. They look at Ukrainian culture as a culture that, that has no reason to exist. It, it's a, it's a, almost like a little Russia. So, and in fact, what Russia does when it invades, when it captures Ukrainian villages and cities, they basically rip, rip out all of uh, school curriculum replace it with Russian curriculum. They completely try to wipe out Ukrainian history and replace it with Russian history. So how's it different from you know, what Nazis did? I mean, yes, there is no concentration camps, this kind of stuff, but there is still, they're still killing, raping, you know, innocent people. So, so yeah, so my, the way I look at what Russia is doing is basically not much different from Nazi Germany. Again, it's a, you know, the, but in, in, you know, in general sense. Wow. Um, you just said you read in Russian. Uh, is So when you're dreaming or when you're thinking, do you think in English or Russian? No, English. It's like when I read in Russian, it requires me a lot of effort. Like Because I just haven't practiced it for so long. I can still read. I'll give you... Okay, okay so now I'm going to switch subjects a little bit. Sure. So, but one of my books, my first investment book was published in, in, in the United States and was published by John Wiley and Sons. And it was translated, I forget at the time, it's six or seven languages from Polish to Romanian to Korean to Japanese and other ones. It never got translated into Russian. And I really, when I wrote this book, I really wanted to make my father proud because my father really never took my profession very seriously. And let, let me tell you what I do. I, I'm a value investor. I run an investment firm, uh, IMA, and I think what I do is kind of an intersection of art and science. My father always looked at what I do as a kind of a, vo a form of legalized gambling. <laughs> so I wanted to show him that what I do is not that. It's actually, uh, there is a lot of thought that goes into it. And it's in, in there, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of foundation. What I do is build a lot of, you know, f foundation. So anyway, so my first book, Active Value Investing, it's published in every other language but Russian. So what I did, I reached out to one of the biggest Russian publishers and I said, would you guys like to publish the book? They, I sent them the PDF of the book. They came back to me and said, sure. And so they went back to Wiley and arranged the, you know, uh, the, the rights, etc. But then they came back to me and said, Vitaly, would you mind editing the book? So they said, we'll translate it. We'll send you the files and you just see you know if you got it right i'm like sure absolutely six months later i get an email with all these files i start reading it and i realized i understand all these words separately but when i put them together like the blank they, they just mean very little to me hmm. and there was a good reason for that because i received all my business education in the United States. I have an undergraduate degree in finance i have a graduate degree in finance i have a cfa designation and so, you know, so I can read in Russian, you know, I can read in Russian and, but when it comes to um, reading a business language, even if it was my own book, I couldn't do it. So, so what I did, I asked my father who has a PhD in electrical engineering to edit the book. He agreed. And I'll be honest, I'm so glad he did this because he actually read this book as an editor would. And we would have this long term conversations about this. And that's probably one of the most, one of the best gratifying experiences of writing the book that my father read it. And, and uh, like, like people won't believe me for a long time, like after I already had a master's degree in finance, my father thought that I should open a bagel shop just in case, <laughs> just in case that, that investment thing doesn't work out. So, after he read this book, he actually admitted that what I do is not legalized gambling. So anyway, so that's that's my that's my you know that's the story. You, you write a lot about your family, and I love it. Whether it's your parents and growing up, and your mom and 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 some of the the pain there, 
as well as your own kids, which I, I got a joy out of. We shared a story about uh, going to volleyball tournaments before we were recording. But can you take us back to the beginning and about your mom and your dad and what was it, what it was like in those early days in, in the USSR, as, as you call it? Yeah. So despite all the difficulties of growing up in Russia, I had a fairly happy childhood until it wasn't. Meaning that I had this loving you know, parents. I have two older brothers who I love. And um, we, we, we grew up in a city in, in the Northwest Russia, Murmansk. And um, if most uh, listeners or, uh, will remember the movie, uh, The Hunt for the Red October, well, that Red October, that fictional submarine actually came from Murmansk. It's mm-hmm. the where the Russians uh, uh, northern fleet is. Um, and uh, so in Murmansk, it's, it's located so far north that during the summertime, there is a this there's unlimited amount of light. So the sun basically never goes down during the summertime. But you have to pay a price for that sunlight in the summertime because during the winter, there is no sunlight for months. Mm-hmm. I would walk to my school in the morning, it's dark. The sun would could come out for 10, 15 minutes while I'm at school. I miss it. And when I walk back, I walk in darkness again. Um, the Now I look at this and I'm like, oh my God, that must have been difficult. But it wasn't because that's the life I knew. That's that's where I was born. That's, that's the life I knew that you know, that was normal to me. Also, when I was growing up, again, remember, this was a Soviet Russia. So stores, a lot of times, had empty shelves. So my mom always uh, struggled to figure out how you know, she's going to feed us every day. But we never went hungry. Um, my father, he has a PhD in electrical engineering. And for 28 years, he taught at Murmansk Marine Academy. And he taught electrical engineering. And he also painted as a hobby. And if you're watching this podcast, you can actually see some of the paintings behind me. Now, when I was uh, on a May 6, 1983, oh no, 1984, I was uh, I was I was 10 years old then. My wife, my mom. It's a day. The reason I remember this day so vividly because it was a day after my mom's 50th birthday. She had a headache, and she, you know, and she was hospitalized with that. And uh, they discovered that she has uh, brain cancer. And um, the I remember that my you no. Know, and so the, on May six that year, I went to see my mom in the hospital, and she you know she had a headache, etc. But she was talking to me. She was asking me all these questions. You know, it's talking to my father. And that was basically the last time I saw my mom, because after that she went through several surgeries, and. Like um, they sent me out in the summertime to see my, you know, to my grandparents, and when I came back, I see this woman at home who has a short gray hair, doesn't re- recognize me. Um, she, the only thing she calls my father, Papa, and that's it. And so that's woman who I like. I didn't like. I walk into my house and there's this woman, and I don't know who it is, and that was my mom. So and then. A few months later, she you know she, she, she dies, and what's and it took me a long time to realize I never really said goodbye to my mom because my mom, to me, the, the, you know died basically May six because the person I saw after that was not really my mom because she she did not look my mom she did not recognize me she you know, um, and that's when my life changed because now my father had to take care of me, and. I kind of rediscovered kind of it's, the the relationship with my father has changed because in the in, before this moment, most of my relationship was like I spent eighty percent of my time with my mom uh, because she took care of me and my father he was you know he was teaching at university he was doing inventions and other things so he spent time with me but his focus was on science. After that, my father basically had to step up and become a full-time father. And I have to tell you, the relationship with my father has changed tremendously. You know, it was good before, now it became very different. But it also, when losing my mom made me appreciate my father so much more because the, this I was cleaning 
I'm, I was clinging to my father because I was so afraid to lose him. And interestingly, that lasted for decades. In a sense, even if it was in my 30s already, um, I made an effort three, four times a week to go to my father uh, uh, for breakfast. We would walk in the park. We uh, we went to Europe, to South Africa. We went to all these different trips to Santa Fe because I knew that losing my mom made me appreciate my father so much more. And I knew that nobody's, you know, like made me realize that this is not forever. And Stoics have this concept called negative, Stoic, you know, negative visualization. I'm sure we'll talk about it. And inadvertently at that time, losing my mother made me negatively visualize that my father won't be there forever. And therefore I should make an effort to spend time with him. I think it's a good lesson for all of us. And sometimes maybe going to a funeral, even if it's for somebody else, it makes you think more about death. And I, I have really come full circle on this after having this podcast and talking to a number of people who have, who have had people die that are close to them and say, let's take this mindset, even if we haven't had something as tragic as what you had happen with your mom, let's do that right now. Maybe you're fortunate enough like me to have your mom and your dad who are still close to you, which I do and say they want to go for a five mile walk on Sundays. Well, I'm going to go like, I want to go as as many of those as I possibly, if I'm in town, I'm going, you know, and because I, I know, like I try to think of this, would I regret, what would I regret more? And I know those won't happen forever. And so I want to get as many of them as possible. And I think when I was reading that story about you and your mom and your dad, it just reinforced that line of thinking that all of us could probably be better at that. This this negative visualization, as as you put it, could you share more about that? Yeah. So let me tell you another story. So when my kids were very very young, I read a book um, by Alice Schroeder called Snowball. That is the only authorized biography of Warren Buffett. Okay, I'm a value investor. I go to Berkshire Hathaway no meetings every single year. I'm a Warren Buffett's fan. In fact, he had an incredible impact on me. So I'm incredibly thankful to him. However, after I read this book, the biggest lesson I got out of this book is not to be like Warren Buffett when it comes to my kids. Warren Buffett was so obsessed about uh, investing that he basically neglected his kids. I mean, you know, they they didn't go hungry, etc. You know, you know, the mom took care of him. But he that's one of his biggest regrets he has that he did not spend enough time with his kids when they were young. And I promised myself that I will make I will I will never get Warren Buffett's wealth. And I'm fine with it. I don't want it. But most importantly, but I will. I never want to have this this regret that I never spent enough time with my kids. And Ryan, this is important. It's not something like when you, when you are passionate about what you do, it's it's like a drug. It's an addiction. So you have to make a mindful decision to kind of to walk away, like to create space uh, to spend time with your kids. And it sounds horrible because it sounds like I don't enjoy it. I do. It's just the addiction to I have to to invest in and in writing is so strong that I have to make this effort. And it has to. And uh, and the way I do it, I basically realize that my kids will not be home forever. I'll give you an example. My daughter is a uh, uh, Hannah is a uh, sixteen years old. He's in she's in eleventh grade in high school. I only have. 400 more days with her uh, when I can drive her to school. After that, she'll be driving and she'll, she'll be going to college. She won't be living at home anymore. So I reframed it. In the past, I looked as driving my kids to school as a chore. Now I look at it as, as a gift. Now I look at it as a, an opportunity I have 400 more days when I can, you know, when I can, when I can take and drive her to school 
we can talk, we can listen to music. And suddenly that, that changes my person, you know, my, that changes how I look at this. And, um, you know, uh, and I always try to find time, like just, just, just the same way as found time to spend with my father. I tried to, yeah, I always, you know, when my kids ask me for something to go outside and play, I never say no. Yeah. It's also, uh, I like one-on-one -on -one dates with kids, especially if you have more than one kid, even if you only have one, still do it. But if you have more than one, one-on-one, -on -one, and I found actually with whether it's a, uh, especially with teenagers that if just a little tip, when you're side by side, it seems like conversation flows more than when you're face to face. And so what I mean by that is side by side is like car rides, or if you go to a restaurant, like sit at the bar, right? I don't like drink alcohol around that, especially when I'm driving kids, but sit at the bar and order your wings or whatever. And side by side, the conversation seems to flow so much better than when you are face to face. And maybe it's the, you know, some of the awkward years. And I, I say this because I don't know how many one on one dates I'm going to get once they leave when they go to college and then they do other things like that may happen not very much. And so I try to maximize those experiences because I, I, I see the finality of that and it scares me and I, I want to make the most of it and, and not only make the most of it, but make the most of each one by being fully present because i think those are the things that those are the memory dividends i'll create for us i hope is that yeah remember we went and sit at the bar and we get wings and then we'd watch the game where we would just hang out and talk or we'd have long car rides to volleyball tournaments as i know you you've had too and i think that's that's like that's that's the ultimate like if you ask me what success is that's it's that it's those kind of in-between moments where we're just hanging out drive into a tournament, sitting, eating some food side by side, going on a walk, maybe. That's what I think it's all about. To me, I, obviously, we have to provide, we got to work really hard, we got to make money. But th that's the thing that I hope, like I'm remembered for by them. I, you, I think you are, you're absolutely right. And I and actually, I think that's a very good insight side by side. I love this. Yeah, that's a very good insight. And if you th if I think about some of the best conversations we, I have with them, when we when we go skiing, the car ride, when we ski, when we sit side by side on the ski lift, yeah. again, and uh, I, 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 if you think about our life, it's at the end, it's just really all just collection of memories. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so let me run this new analogy by you. Okay. Okay, there are two ways we can go through life. We can go through life the same way we go through the airport when we get out like you, you get off the plane and you look for the baggage claim or for the exit right so what you're doing you're really not looking left or right you're just going forward you're looking for the destination or you can go through life as if you're going through the art museum and you are not just focused forward for this kind of uh, for the destination but uh, at this destination but you're looking left and right you kind of slowing down and you actually enjoying it. Okay. And I think for somebody who is driven, it, a lot of times it's so easy to have this kind of go through life as it, you know, as you're going through the airport and we have to, we have to kind of, um, to go to put it, um, we have to mindfully look at ourselves and ask ourselves: Are we going? Are we, are we at, the, at the airport, or we? At, you know, we probably should switch to the art museum mode. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, I love that one. I mean, it, it, sometimes we play these little games where, let's say, you're driving two and a half hours to a volleyball tournament, and usually you got to drive the night before it starts, early the next morning, and you're staying in a hotel. And sometimes we'll get into traffic. It's normal, right? Somebody maybe there's an accident or something happens. There's traffic on the highway. And my, my wife, Miranda, does the same thing uh, where we say, there's nobody I'd rather be stuck in traffic with than mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And, and so it, as a way, instead of just complaining, because like complaining doesn't help the traffic move. It's not going to move. But instead of that, we view it as I get to do this versus I have to do this or, oh, God, we got traffic. Because what are you going to do? You're just going to the hotel and you're, yeah, you may get some food and just hang out. But, hey, we're hanging out now. So instead of complaining and say, oh, 
you make a statement like that, and obviously they laugh or they make fun of you or they say something cheesy because you just said something cheesy, but but it really seems to change like change the tenor of 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 what's happening in that environment with your child or your partner or whoever you're you're there with. They laugh a little bit, and I think it makes it better, and it also shifts your mind to like be ready to say something like that as opposed to going straight to traffic means I complain. Yeah, so what you did, you re reframed. And this is a concept you know, uh, uh, I got from Stoic philosophers, right? And, you know, and, uh, and uh, reframing allows you to look at the same situation from a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of, because a lot of times we choose, you know, we choose to look at the situation from a negative perspective where it doesn't have to be negative. It could be, you can look at it as neutral as a positive. Um, if somebody, uh, uh, Mark Manson wrote it in, in one of his books, if somebody puts a gun to your head and say, run 26 miles, you're going to feel like being victimized and you're going to run because there's a gun to your head and you're, you, you're not going to enjoy, you're not going to enjoy it in, in your mind. You'll be very miserable. But people do this all the time when they run marathons. The different and the, and they just the, the the only difference they choose to do this versus they feel like they've been forced to do this. And when you're stuck in traffic, you can look at it as an opportunity, right? Spend time with your children, have a conversation, listen to music, listen to a podcast, and suddenly. This is not stuck in traffic. This is with the time you you choose to do something that's fun. And uh, this reframing, I feel it's something, to me, it did not come naturally. It's something that I had to teach myself to do. So I want to pull a quote and then ask you to expand on, I'll do that probably a few times here that we have left, but you, you write, in our relationships, we should set a goal, not for someone to love us, but to behave according to our values and to be a good, caring partner. We cannot control whether people will love us, but we can control our actions and our behavior. This reminds me of the quote, how to get a great spouse, deserve one. And I think that is right in line with it. It's like trying to get everyone to love you. It's like, no, be the type of person that, deserves that and you have to first exude those qualities yourself and if so it will probably work out but i love that 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 quote that that you put in your book as a writer the last thing you want to do is try to figure out what your readers want to read and write for them because if this does not organically click with who you are the quality of your writing is going to suffer. Okay, so what you try to, what you should be doing, is find what interests interests you and write that. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you're going to find an audience that wants to read this, because the quality of your writing is going to be so much better when you're going to try to be somebody who you are not. And the same thing applies to relationships, right? Because if if you're going to try to adjust to become, un, you know, if you if you're going to try to create a behavior that's unnatural to you, then you're going to be miserable, and it's going to be very difficult for you to, to sustain this behavior. But you should caref carefully uh, think about what your values should be, what values do you want to have, and then behave, strive to behave to those values, and then. If you do this, then you then uh, and also you know it's also important. You want to behave, you know, uh, in relation to your spouse or your kids or or your friends, in the way that they, they would want to love you because your behavior is a you know, you you treat them with respect, you know, all these different things, and then that's gonna if it's either gonna work out or not. But you can control. Here's here's the key: you can control how you how you behave. You cannot control if they're gonna love you or not. And speaking of that, you write about a relationship with somebody from earlier in your career named Mike 
C O N N. Is it Khan? Is that how you pronounce the last name? Mike Khan, yes. Yeah, Mike Khan. Okay. Founder and then CEO of IMA, which you're the current CEO, yeah. which is pretty cool. But anyway, you, you talked to him, and one of the things you said about him is that I've yet to meet a person who is better at talking to anyone about anything and not wanting anything from that other person except a good conversation. Can you tell me more about Mike? Yeah. So Mike is a 6'4 uh, boy from Iowa. Who, who grew up in a town, Lewis, Iowa, which had 300 people. Um, and uh, Mike, when he, in, when he was late teens, he moved to Colorado. And he's a, such a smart guy, he ended up going to Harvard. So, you know, he's probably one of the first kids from his little town who went to college and, probably, and the only one who went to Harvard. I'm sure of that. Um, but I think this kind of, this uh, Mike kept this kind of uh, small town, you know, small town personality. And I remember when we, we would go on a business trip and we'd go to, I forget, to Burger King or something. And my, at the time, Mike smoked. And uh, I forget if I, I, I don't, I didn't smoke at the time, I think I've already, but, and, uh, and Mike would talk to anybody and he would just have a conversation, uh, share stories. And the, you know, it was just a random stranger. And then the person would leave and, and that was it. Mike just enjoyed, Mike was, but Mike, when he had a conversation with that person, he was present. And, 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 you know, and Mike never, he was really never a good marketer uh, because like, you know, because he, you know, to be a good marketer, I guess you, you, you always have to ask, like, you know, ask for something. And Mike never did. Um and uh, I always admire that, you know, the quality of Mike. And you're just absolutely lighthearted person who, uh, uh, you know, who was my mentor for the last 25 years, I guess. You uh, also write about being in permanent beta, perpetually in beta, and es essentially meaning it's a liberating feeling because it gives you the chance to constantly improve yourself, to learn, to grow. It doesn't mean you need to be buried just in self-help books, but you need to have this in beta slash like student of life attitude. And, and, and that's like the ethos of what being a learning leader is, is we're going to be decisive. We're going to take action. We're going to do stuff, but we also are going to have an open mind and a willingness to change our mind when better evidence presents itself. And uh, I, I, I really love this, this part of the book and your mindset on being essentially a lifelong student. Can you share more about how you think about that? One of the biggest enemies you have as a leader, as an investor, as a human being in, in general, is your ego. Because your ego basically tells you that you should not learn because you already know the answer. Um, ego is extremely dangerous in investing because um, I'll give you an example. Uh, SoftBank, which is run by Masayoshi San. Masayoshi San is an incredible investor, and uh, we used to own the stock uh, a long time ago. And right now, he just, you know, SoftBank just took a write down of, I forget, 20 or 40 billion dollars. And Masayoshi San basically said, you know, admitted that he was, he got completely arrogant. He, he was, you know, he, and I think that's that that is his that's what led to uh, this loss. So, as an investor, so I'm gonna get off topic a little bit. What you need to do, you need to become what I call thoughtfully arrogant. What does it mean, thoughtfully arrogant? Well, investing in general, especially if you're a value investor, you know, you basically it's an arrogant decision because when you're buying a stock especially value investor because you're buying stocks that everybody hates. You're buying them. Uh, you're, it's, an, you're, it's an arrogant decision because you're saying, I am right and you're wrong. Is, it, is that a value? So can you define a, what a value yeah. investor is? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much bigger discussion. Okay. But value investment philosophy, if you think about Warren Buffett, he practices value investment philosophy. Uh, but you're looking to buy companies that are undervalued. Okay, a lot of times for companies to be undervalued, people have to, the everybody has to agree there is something wrong with the company, and because everybody agrees, everybody sell you know they they sell the stock. 
okay, and the stock declines. Now, a lot of times, even those people may be right, but there, there's something wrong with the company because they collectively make the decision. They depress the stock price so much that to the scenario where even if they're right, they're already worse scenarios priced into it. Okay, so a company might have been worth originally a dollar and now maybe worth 60 cents, okay? But everybody drives it to the price to 20 cents that even if they were right, this company is not worth a dollar anymore, it's worth 60 cents. Now the price is so low that you can still make money because you will still be able to make money because now it's so cheap. Isn't okay, isn't? Because- but isn't everyone in a value investor then? Like, doesn't everybody want to do that? I mean, it's a lot harder in practice than in just talking about it. But I, I would assume everybody's a value investor. Well, this, this, that is a phenomenal point. And Warren Buffett would say that, you know, the whole term value investing is redundant <laughs> because it, it should be just called investing. It should be just called I mean, I, I hope I'm a value investor. I don't know. I try to be. <laughs> I hire no, no, other people to help me with it. But yeah. I, you, you, you know, I think you're exactly, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's a, I guess the, uh, no, you, you're absolutely right. And it's a, you, it's just the reason I have to use the term to separate myself that what I do is rational. And that just beca- because a lot of people, what happens just because you bought a stock does not make you an investor. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a lot of times, in fact, I would argue a lot of times investors are, they, they're really uh, gamblers because they're buying and selling stocks. They know what the company does and they say it's company. the company has a great product, but they don't ask the same question, what is it worth? What, what What is the company worth? Anyway, so let me, but let me get back to the, gotcha. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, to the thought for arrogance. Um, so what could happen to you as an investor when you become successful you start thinking that uh, that because I'm successful, next stock I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna make money. And what? So at this point, your line of thinking is a completely based on pure arrogance. Mm. Now, what you do, you forget that the reason you made money in the past because you had a process where you unless companies and you wanted to buy them at significant discount of what they're worth. Okay. You forget about that, you know, that your success came from process and you start attributing it to your, to you being you. Okay. And that eventually leads to what happened to Masayo Shesan uh, at Soul Bank. Now, I call what we do, I have to be thoughtfully arrogant because I still have to make a decision where I'm going against the crowd when I'm buying a stock. However, I make this decision because we put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of research analyzing the company. We looked at the all the country opinions. We uh we you know we we you know, we basically disproved them and that led us to believe that the company we're paying for 20 cents is worth 60. Gotcha. Okay. So the reason it's a thoughtful arrogance because we got to this arrogance through doing our, you know, through through putting a sweat in research, you know. Um, now I forget the question I was answering though. Oh, being oh, talking- being a student, being a student of life. Yes. Yeah, per- a perpetual so, beta. Yeah. So if you're a student of life, then everything you look at, you are not hundred percent certain that you're always questioning and you're looking always for the opposite opinion. And then when you arrive only through thorough research, you you arrive to an opinion. And you still, even at that point, you're still open uh, to other points of view. I find that it's liberating on so many different levels. I'll give you another example. I play chess. I'm a, I play chess for a long time, but I never really took lessons. And I started to play chess more seriously over the last couple of years. And I lose a lot. But I because I have this because I have this student of life mentality, when I lose, I basically look at it, well, that's a part of the tuition. I I don't get angry, I don't get upset. Because that's a I see this happening to a lot of times, uh, to, to other chess players. They lose, they get angry, and some of them actually stop playing because you know they keep losing. 
if you just look at it as a as as you just look at it as you're learning, because I'm sure I would lose every time I learn something. Well, say so if I lose, I learn something, I gained. So that's the attitude I have. Um, let's talk about leaders a little bit more. I run a, you know, I run a, uh, I'm a CEO of IMA, so I have employees here. I want everybody here to be a student of life. So I want everybody to be learners. And, but to do this, um, and I want us to be what I call like what I call like in the, in the scientist mode. In other words, I want everybody here to when we, when we uh, especially in research, in research, what we're trying to do, uh, Seneca has the saying, time discovers truth. As an investor, what I'm trying to do is to discover truth before time does. Now, for me to have a discussion with my analysts, um, we need to, all of us have to be in a scientist mode because we have to be looking for the truth. So therefore, if somebody held a view and they see data that uh, where they have to, you know, that uh, that would lead them to change their mind. I want them to be able to do this, but for them to do this, they need to be comfortable with that. So, as a leader, I have to publicly show to them that I do this all the time, and when I do that, they feel safe uh, that they can do this too. And yeah. that's very that's very very important as a leader. It to starts show- with you. Yeah. yeah, it's a, to you show set that the you- tone for everybody else that we are learning leaders here constantly. I love love the um, that you write about the best way to guard against ego is by thinking of ourselves as evergreen students. Albert Einstein said, "As our circle of knowledge expands, so does the circumference of darkness surrounding it. We should welcome the circumference of darkness wholeheartedly." And like I I so identify it with this because. At the beginning of this podcast, seven and a half, almost eight years ago, Vitaly, I thought like, okay, I have a pretty good handle on leadership, and I think I know what I'm talking about from playing football and then leading in the corporate corporate world and all this. And then I talked to more people who are far, far wiser than me, and I'm learning about them. I'm writing a lot. I'm publishing books. I'm giving speeches. And then I start realizing, oh, my goodness, the more I learn – the more I realize I have no idea what's going on, right? I'm expanding my zone of what I'm my of competence, I think. But it's weird how now I've realized there's so, so much more out there that I don't know. And isn't that a weird paradox when it comes to learning and leading and just life in general? So you're so right about this. And I when I was writing this book, my wife told me, Aren't you too young to write this kind of book? And I you know, and, and I, the first, my first reaction, I kind of got upset about this. But then I thought about it. And I realized she was right. And then I realized all I have to do is just call it volume one. Mm. Because, and, I, and I'll tell you this, I already changed my mind on some of the things I wrote in the book. Yeah. And that is the beauty of this. That means I learned, right? So that means that I have an opportunity when I write it either next edition or write other articles or even volume two, I can, I can say, here's what I used to think. And here's why I changed my mind on this. And that is absolutely fine. I love, love that element of the fact of how you approach this. Um, and you, you, we, we start at the beginning talking about kids. And uh, again, I, I think about this so much because they're, they're, they're everything, right? Um, what is it like, what do you do intentionally to be fully present in your kids' lives while at the same time have this massive responsibility of being the CEO of your company? Uh, there are so many ways to answer it. Uh, first of all, the way I work, um, I, the stuff is this. Number one, I identified things that I love to do. I realized there are certain things only I can do. Uh, so I try to match what I love to do and and things that I'm the only one who can do this. And that's what I try to focus on. Mm-hmm. And I try to outsource and delegate everything else. 
Like, what are those things? Um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you one example. When uh, you were, you know, uh, when we were scheduling this podcast, you were, you know, you were, you know, you are, your people were communicating with my assistant, Barbara. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that process probably took three or four emails to find the time that works for you and for me. Mm-hmm. If, if I did all that, it probably would spend three or four hours a week or whatever, you know, trying to schedule my, you know, uh, 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 my calendar. By having my assistant do this, now I'm basically able to, you know, save a few hours a week on doing other things. And, you know, and, you know, as an example, um, I also, I say no a lot. You know, I, I, I'll give you, I'll give you one example. Um, I never give speeches. Hmm. Let me explain what I mean by this. I, I used to give speeches where I would, you know, throw to another city and do a speech. One thing I found that I don't like giving speeches. Here's why. Because before the speech, even months, weeks before the speech, my, my mind always going through the speech and thinking about this. And also, and while I'm giving the speech, I'm not really enjoying it. However, what I found that I really enjoy doing questions and answers. Mm. It requires very little preparation, so it consumes very little real estate of, of my, you know, in my brain before the speech. And I learn something you know, when I answer those questions, and I really enjoy it. And here's the thing. If I enjoy it, when I answer it, people will enjoy it because my answer will be better. So you know what I started doing? When people ask me to give a speech, I said, sure, but it has to be a Q&A in a Q&A format. And, and here's the amazing part. 95% of the time people said, okay. And mm-hmm. this is, and this is so, so I stopped doing things I don't like to do anymore. You know, and uh, that's another example. So this way I, I'm more efficient with my, you know, it, it's just, it was another example. I'm a lot more efficient with my time. Um, you know, another thing I found is that with my kids, we just schedule to do things all the time. We, you know, we you know, we go skiing. Um, we once a year we go to Santa Fe. This is something we do every time. I just spend uh, went uh, spent uh, spent ten days in Europe with my with uh, my older kids. And this is an important point. When I'm at home and we have dinner, I put away my phone and I try to be present. You know, I'm you know, so I'm. Jewish and I'm Jewish and my wife is very religious. Every Friday night we get together and we have a family dinner and we have a conversation during family dinner. And that is a, and I'm sure there's other religions have their own, you know, own days, but even if you're not religious, pick a day, it could be Wednesday. And so, and we just have a conversation. We laugh. We, you know, on Saturdays we play board games, etc. And attention is a currency of time. Mm-hmm. And so being in the same room as your kids is not enough. You want to be present when you are with them. And just really just have a conversation, not be judgmental, and just listen to them. And um, my son and I have a very similar relationship uh, as I have with my father. You know, my son and I talk a few times a day, and he shares me what's happening with him. We talk about Korean events, this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, and I, he looks at me as I'm um, one of his closest friends. And I, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's how I guess, you know, that's how I spend time with my kids, I guess. Uh, do you have time for a couple of really quick questions? I have as much time as you need. Why do you take cold showers? So there's a lot of health benefits for this. And Wim Hof will tell you, you know, all the reasons for that. I find, I do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, I only take them in the morning. So just very, very clear about this. I only take them in the morning because they wake me up. That's reason number one. But there is another reason that's more important, I think. When I'm, when I, I turn on the shower and, and it's, you know, and I put it on the cold setting and then I stand in front of it. And I'll be honest, every single time, I don't want to go into it. And 
then I ask myself, what's the worst thing is going to happen to me? Like, it's like, it's not even skydiving. Like when you do skydiving, at least there is a tiny probability they will die, right? There is a risk of death, like tiny, tiny probability. Here, there is just a little bit of discomfort. And when I force myself to do this, I realize that a lot of, you know, let's say I'm training myself to do things that may be um, unpleasant at first, but if you do this enough, they stop being unpleasant. And that's I'm basically exercising this mo- this muscle of doing things that may be uh, overcoming a little bit of fear of uh, and uh, and but over time, if you do this long enough, uh, you realize it's not such a big deal when you get used to it. So that's that's why you know that's why I do cold showers. At some point, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on Wim Hof's. Uh, retreat and I'm going to do ice baths and stuff. So I haven't done it yet. What's the best thing about having a regular writing practice? Writing is probably the most important thing that has happened to me as a human being, as an individual. It's kind of, it's on the, somewhere there with having kids. Uh, I have a chaotic mind. And every day I get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and I write for two hours. And what writing does, it does several things. Number one, it allows me to um, to organize my thoughts. Number two, if you look at our mind, it's a, and I'm going to give you this mental model, we have a conscious mind and subconscious minds. Conscious mind, think of it as a kind of a, a uh, lower powered computer like your iPhone and subconscious mind think of it as a IBM mainframe this super super computer so when we write when we do something creative we create we create this magical connection between conscious mind and subconscious mind and i'll tell you like what i'm about to say is going to sound ridiculous but a lot of times when i finish writing i and when i say i i mean my conscious mind and myself are surprised of what I just wrote because mm-hmm. a lot of this content came from my subconscious mind. And by the way, this experience is not unique to me. Talk to anybody who writes a lot for a living or who writes a lot, they they, they have the same experience because, and so right, what writing allows me to do it to establish this connection. And that basically elevated my IQ by 20 points. And Ryan, I needed that 20 points of IQ desperately. <laughs> so, uh, um, it's a, it's probably one of the biggest. It, again, it's I've been writing for since two thousand four for eighteen years now, and if if you listen to this interview and there were any insights that jumped at you, thank my writing for this. That's it. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. it's just because it's just because I write. If you want to clarify your thinking, get it from your head to the page, and this is why I've found the most impactful and effective leaders have writing practices. And for those who make the excuse that they don't have time, that's an excuse. It's it's not true, it's an excuse. We will make time for things that are priority and this is a thing that I believe, and and the reason I believe it is because I speak to so many people like you, Vitaly, who are highly accomplished and are only getting better and better and better. It's because they're regularly clarifying their thinking by taking this mess of what we have in our head and trying to get it down on the page in a somewhat coherent way and through repetition and thinking about it and some editing and publishing some and talking it out then afterwards that's how that keeps getting sharper and sharper and sharper and so the most precise thinkers and precise speakers are usually reading a ton and writing a lot as well. And and so for, this is all about leadership, right? And leaders, I think this is a an absolute necessary skill for us to be precise thinkers and speakers and great communicators. Well, here is a way to do it. It's not easy. It takes time. It needs consistency. But this is, I think, from what I've seen and gathered over the years, the way uh, to make it happen. You're you're yet another example of that. I have one more question, Vitaly. You're talking to someone who's earlier in their career. Your kids are about to be this age, at least your older ones maybe. Maybe they're say like early 20s. They graduated yeah. college recently and they're thinking about what to do. They know they want to 
be a co- positive contribution in the world. They want to leave a dent. They they want to they want to do right by people. They want to do good. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you'd give to that person? Well, let me tell you what I tell my son. Um, don't choose your career based on how much money you're going to make there. Because if that is your most important criteria, you're going to have a very miserable life. Because money is a very bad motivator. It's 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 mo- it motivates you up to a point. After you got to, after you get to a certain point, every incremental dollar buys less and less of ha- happiness. Well, I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if it's happiness. It just buys less and less. Um, what I mean by that is just after you paid for after you paid for your basic needs. That you know that that money bring you know, just they that money has a lot less value to you. Now, um, I tell my son that like my son is twenty one years old. He until recently he did not know what he wants to do. You know he you know, and I told him to tinker with a lot of different things. You know, like I made I changed seven majors before I found my love for investing. Um, so I told him to tinker you know, to do different internships. And talk to different people, and and see if something clicks with him. Um, whatever he does, I tell him he has to have a soul in the game. Mm. And uh, and I and and, and uh, wh- what I mean by this, uh, so he needs to choose the you know, the game. Some you know the game is something that he's going to be doing for the rest of, you know for a long long period of time. It's going to consume a lot of his time. And it has to be meaningful to him. And when you have soul in that, that means that you'd be doing it if you're making a lot less money. You're doing it because for the love of that. I'm investing and I'm writing, and I'm not I haven't worked a day in my life for the last 20 something years because I love what I do. I have it's you know that what I do has all of me. And money is just a very secondary consideration. And I would not do anything to, uh, like I have, like, because I have soul in the game, I have sacred taboos. There are certain things I would never do because it would just, I would lose, you know, I would not have soul in the game if I do it. So that's what I want my my son to have and my, you know, and my daughters as well when, you know, when they're a little bit older. Um, you know, actually, let me, let me go take a step further. Let me, my 16 year old daughter, Hannah, started to teach. Uh, chess lessons to eight year old girl, and um, before first lesson, I asked her, "Did you prepare for the lesson?" She said, I, "You know, I kind of know what I'm going to teach her." And I and I and this is where I went through my speech, and I told her, "You need to have soul in a game." And here's why: because what you do, like, imagine the impact you could have on this girl if you teach her properly, if you do a great job she may become the next world champion in chess. Can you imagine the impact you could have on this girl where 20 years later, 30 years later, she'll be thanking you for teaching her? So the whenever you can have a substantial impact on somebody, you always have to have a soul in the game. And so she, you know, my daughter went and watched uh, YouTube lessons, et cetera. And uh, you know, my wife told me that, you know, she had a great lesson. But I think... This is when you start, not just when, not just when, you know, you, you start looking for your first job, etc., or trying to select your career, but you start with little things like this, you know, uh, doing chess lessons for the kids. Love it, man. The book is called Soul in the Game, The Art of a Meaningful Life. I highly recommend it. I'm grateful that you've chosen to invest so much time to get those thoughts from your mind down onto the page uh, for the benefit of us. This is this is one of the few books that's kind of essentially your journal of life, a lot about kids, parents, upbringing, personal stories. I don't think many of those types of books work. It's really hard to do them well. And this one just killed. I mean, it got recommended to me by many people from different parts of my life that don't know each other. So whenever that happens, I read the book. 
So that's why I was excited to, to, to have a chance to talk with you. And you certainly not only lived up to it, but exceeded my expectations, man. So I really appreciate it, Vitaly. And I would love to continue our dialogue as Absolutely. we both progress, man. Absolutely. Ryan, you're a phenomenal host. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.